Welcome. My name is Rowie and this is Kim, my partner. Um, we are really, really proud today because we are having a special interview of one of our very, very dear, and I mean dear, members, Brian Sims. Welcome, Brian. Hello there. How are you doing? Good, good. good. We're also joined by Roxanne Swainhart. She's here as well to help with our interviews. Um, hi, Roxy. Hope you're well. Hope Texas is nice. So oh, yeah. just a quick introduction of what, what this is. Brian's been doing interviews of other people, some of the amazing new channelers that are coming around through Hugo and also outside. And um, we thought it's fitting if we interview Brian and tell his story and give his chance to shine because he's got some really beautiful things to share with us on his journey and see if that identifies with anybody else out there as well and just to see what, what, what happens, what the process is, how you get to this this pinnacle, this very almost elite type of group that we are with. I don't mean that in a secret way or any sort of uh, a hierarchy way. I just mean it's, we're quite um, unique in a way. So it's great to hear the journeys that people are going on and how we're interacting. And Brian has been a member of, of Human Colony pretty much since the start. And some of the some of the interactions he's had with some of the members have been vitally key to bringing out some of the talents and some of the specialities that people are now doing within Hukula. And we really have a lot to thank him for. Yes, I have a lot to thank Brian for. Yeah. So I just want to big a big warm welcome to Brian Sims. Yeah. Round of applause. Yay, sound effects. Yay. <laughs> so Kim's going to ask some questions to Brian. And um, yeah, we're going to go from there. So again, big introduction to Brian Sims. Welcome, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me OK? We can hear you very well. Good, good. I just I just want to add something to, to what Rory said. Brian, when I came to Hugo, you were one of the first members that I interacted with. And I appreciated that so much. You were very welcoming. You're very grounded. You're a very, very balanced person. And, and you still are to this day. And it's been an absolute pleasure to be in your company and also to have had your support. So I want to say thank you. And I would also like the membership to know that you have been consistently active. So you're very informed as to what's going on around the website, what's happening in the community, those kinds of things. So I would like to make you kind of a uh, go-to, go-to man amongst the membership. If they can, if they, if they have questions about who's doing what and where and when, um, to come to you um, because you know you are the go-to man. So. Anyway, with that and with love and thanks, Brian, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. The first one being, what is your earliest memory of being on this planet, of being within your family in this lifetime? Going through mom's birth canal. Very nice. And how did you come to experience that? Um, a flash of light, uh, just, I, I, when I was younger, right before I started losing that uh, memory of real earliness, when I was around one or two years of age, I remember in the womb a little bit and coming out through a tunnel of light, like coming through the birthing yeah. process. Yeah. Um, I remember a little screaming. That's probably from mom. <laughs> but yeah. I remember, I remember a flash, and coming into this reality as a physical being. This, you know, at least this lifetime. Sure. That's yeah. the earliest, like flash of remembrance. So, yes. do you feel like that has shaped your journey in any way? The fact that you had that memory. Um. So young that you know you just thought everybody remembered. Yeah, because when you're young, I, I, in a way, um, I, I don't know if it totally shaped me yet, but I, whatever trauma or anything that I felt inside the womb, which is very interesting because I know it can affect uh, yeah. the development a little bit of a child. Very much. Um, 
Um, but I'm not sure. It might be a part of it. I, I think how the birthing process and how uh, the child, or at least myself, came out. Maybe mm -hmm. it, you know, it was less dramatic, less pain. You know, I'm not going to say painful, for, less painful for my mother, but it was, um, I think, uh, a learning experience for her, and um, mm. it helped, sh you know, shaped her who she is, having us children. So. Of course. Were you her first child? Yes. Yes. Mm. Okay. Of how many siblings? Um, I have. Three biological, two brothers, one sister, and then a, a stepbrother. Okay, so it was a sizable family. Yeah, not too bad. So, did, did that mean that you had a lot of time to spend by yourself? Yes, this is where I, I grew, especially in the elementary years. Um, I was always curious. I wanted to absorb so much. I, I never stopped asking questions. Mm. Um, it started real early. I'm glad you're bringing this up. Mm -hmm. um, it started when I was about three years old. Um, I'll go into my um, my what happened to me. I was on uh, a lake. Um, my grandmother had some friends who invited us up to the lake. And I was up there. I'll make it pretty short, not too long. And I was outside. I was about three and a half. I can remember this. There was a gust of wind that just out of nowhere, I remember a push, a real strong push. And it pushed me to the edge of uh, the like um, kind of like a, uh, a huge hill. And the hill went down into a lake. Mm -hmm. And it was by the driveway that wrapped around uh, the area. But this wind just pushed me, and I couldn't stop. I was trying to stop so I wouldn't go over the edge. It was probably about a 60 degree angle. And I, I, re I rolled down the hill. I couldn't stop. I went into the lake. Um, I couldn't swim. I didn't know how to swim. Mm -hmm. um, I started gasping for air, like I was going under a little bit. And I was trying to come up, trying to stay afloat and reach the edge again because I rolled over into the, I was trying to turn around and reach back for the, um, the siding so I can grab on to something and pull myself back out of the lake. I couldn't. And it was, the wall was like, I think, three or four feet high. So even trying to reach for it and get out of the water, I really couldn't. And I was drowning. I was literally drowning. Wow. And um, I screamed out three, three or four times. I looked up trying to doggy paddle. And mm -hmm. I looked up and I was like screaming, like, help, help, you know. Um, my uncle, thank God, he looked over the edge um, on, I think, my last breath, I, I decided just to let go. I, I yeah, didn't yeah. care if I died or not. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't care if I died. And I just, because I, I couldn't, I was so exhausted, you know, and it was, to me, it felt like eternity, because you're trying to survive, you know? Sure. And I, I, t I felt like I took my last breath. And this is amazing. At that instant, when I went under the water and I didn't come back up, you know, for a little bit, I saw a flash of bluish, bluish greenish light. I flashed, and then my vision cleared, and I could see underwater perfectly. Like, oh my gosh! Like, uh, yeah. how do you say it? Um, oh, just like panoramic view, and everything was so pristine, so clear, and mm -hmm. just for a second, an instant, and like I was like, I'm breathing underwater, like. Wow, I'm breathing. I'm not dead, but it was amazing. Like I could breathe, but yet I was underwater. Yeah. And I did. I wasn't struggling at that point. I was not struggling. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I felt a hand or something grab me and, and pulled me out. And it was my uncle. He actually saved my life. Mm -hmm. And he pushed the water in my stomach. I felt like I was coughing up lots of water. Yeah. I was coughing a lot. And I remember it's like three and a half. I was, uh, uh, and I just, this water just kept coming out of me. But he saved my life, you know. And it was amazing. But yeah. I was so content in that, 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 that split second that I let go of everything. And yeah. I didn't care if I died or not. Because I couldn't, I was struggling, but I was so exhausted. And it probably yeah. went on a couple minutes before he even came, got down there, you know. 
to save my life. So I I owe my uncle, my uncle Mark, a lot of thanks. So thank really you, cool. Uncle Mark. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, so, that was the first flash. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's really pivotal. So and the fact that you remember it so clearly and you remember the letting go, um, yes. and what you saw and what you experienced, uh, that that is incredibly special. Um, I'm so glad you're here with us now to tell us about it. So, okay, from that that moment forward, what is the next memory you have that is significant to you? Yes, the next one is moving up into elementary age, uh, school when I was about six or seven. Um, that was significant. Like I said, I had younger brothers at the time. One was just a baby. Uh, my other brother was, let's see here, if I was six, he's four years younger, so he was like two, Brad. Um, but the earliest remember I have of one about six or seven moving forward was um, was extraterrestrial contact. That's when I re started remembering what was going on then. Did you understand I, that that's what it was? Um, no, at the, at the time I didn't. Um, all I remember, I'll make a short story out of this one. I was laying on a table. I don't know how I got there. Um, I remember I went to bed. I was laying on a table, and there were some beans around the table, and they were scanning me. He was using some type of scanning mm -hmm. technology, like a light. It was really beautiful. I'm trying to remember the colors. Maybe mm -hmm. an orange glow, but there was like a scan of my body. And then... There was a tall being with a beautiful, huge, round head, mm -hmm. and it was the tallest being in the room. And all these little beings were round around the edge, around the table. And the being was at the because I was totally on my back, laying down, and this big, huge being was at the right foot, or my right foot, all the way down, at the edge of the edge of the table. And were you tied down? Oh, you just stayed no. really. I didn't feel like I didn't feel like Strain. I wasn't feel like it was totally against my will, you know. Right. I felt like I was just being observed. Like I was mm -hmm. I was here for a reason. They were scanning me, maybe working on me. They were working on me. I do remember that. They mm -hmm. opened me um, down on my I remember this on my stomach or up toward the heart. They were working on the my stomach area up. I don't remember down below any farther than that, but I do remember the heart area in my nervous system or something but they went in and I thought I, I looked down like how can they do that without me feeling any pain it was totally painless yeah. and they were inside like working on me or something and um, after that I, I, I felt I felt different and I remember the being saying and I and I said please allow me to remember this I kept mm -hmm. repeating this over and over. I want to remember it. Like, I thought it was a dream at the time, but it was mm -hmm. so vivid, so real. I want to remember this. Please don't. Don't forget. Don't forget. The bean said, the, the tall one with the big um, round head said, um, you're not going to remember this until later on, much, much later, like in life. You know what I mean? I remember them saying, we can't allow you to remember everything right now. But yeah. later in life, I was about six or seven, we will, you will remember more. And I kept just wanting to remember it all now, what's going on, because I wanted to share this or talk about it. So do you recognize the species? The species? Mm -hmm. The beans? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, it almost looked like, I want to say, um, the tall head, real tall, being either, I want to kind of say it's like, um, either Lyran, or like, a, like, um, kind of like a Lyran, or, uh, what's the other name I'm looking for? Um, not Pleiadian, but, um, Is it a Zeta? No, they they had kind of like them around me. These little uh, guys, uh, mm -hmm. the little beans, the tall ones, the your typical gray type. But they were in suits. Right. They were in suits. Mm -hmm. And 
the one that I remember looked like, um, oh, what do you call it? Um, not, oh, Syrian. Syrian. Ah. Syrian. That's really interesting. Yes. Can you describe how they appeared to you? Yes. Uh, the Syrian, or this being was wearing a white, kind of like a white garment all the way down. It came like at a V mm. up around. And then the head, I remember it was just, this being was so tall in the room. It had to be seven to eight feet tall. I mean, it was just huge. But it was toward the end of the bed. But it was just, yeah, it, was, it just appeared pretty big, pretty tall. That's um, and all the other beings only came up to the like the stomach, of yeah, the, of the stomach. That was it. Hmm. So um, that's obviously something that you must think a lot about now. Yeah, because I'm I'm digging more for information just to pull it out of my memory banks. It's me sitting, be meditative, and just really mm. wanting to grasp some of these concepts and and who they are and. Um, I've been questioning myself. I'm getting more of the answers, but it's it's just yeah. a time process. Um, it did shape me in a way. Oh, here's the site. So after that part, when they um, uh, were done with me, they said goodbye, and I I woke up. I, I just in, woke up in my bed. I had an instinct to go right to the window. As soon as I woke up that night, mm -hmm. I went right to the window. I opened the curtain, and on the other side that I saw was this white light that was on the ground. It slowly went up, 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 up and it shot, went straight up into the sky. Mm -hmm. And in this interaction, you felt totally safe. There wasn't anything, you know, that you were no, scared negative. by. Or... Yeah, I was totally at calm and peace, and I felt like that was a real connection and interaction that I had with these beings because. My first inclination, the instinct was, as soon as I woke up, go to the window. <laughs> How many people do that, you know, right after you get wake up, go to the window? Yeah. And it was at night. It was in the middle of the night. I went to the window, and I saw this white light slowly go up, 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 like this orb or something. And, just, and it was good. It had to have been, you know, hundreds of feet away or thousands of feet away. But I saw it go up through the trees and go straight up, and then I, I couldn't track it anymore. Mm. So, yeah. so, okay, so at that night you just decided that you would go and get back in your bed and go to sleep? Yeah, because I, I just stared at the window for a while. I was just, I was like hoping that it would come back. I, yes. I was just staring there, like an amazement and awe, like, wow, because I knew, you know, even at 6, 7, you know, you know what a plane is going by, or flashing lights, and it wasn't that. It just went, mm -hmm. it just went straight up. It was like on the ground level, and it went up through the trees, and it was gone. And so, so did you ever share this? I never shared it. I never shared it with my mom, dad, or my brother, my siblings. Never shared it with them. Yeah. So, so, so this is the first time you've shared this with anybody, or oh, have you shared the story um, with other members before? Yeah, I've shared the story a little bit with other members, but I've never went into like the de detail of it. So mm. that's that's really intriguing. Really intriguing. Very special. Okay, so. Moving on from there, the next pivotal moment for you. Um, I'm gonna say around nine or ten. I got into Boy Scouts. When I got into Boy Scouts, things really started to um, shift. Um, I started questioning. I started questioning the church. Ah, <laughs> this is fun. church. Okay, can you yes. please define the church? What did the church symbolize for you? At that time, the church was like a symbol of, you know, um, of honor, respect. Um, it was more like um, you couldn't question anything. I felt like I couldn't ask the pastor or the priest at the time was about it, certain. What's that? Did it feel like duty? Yeah, like more like obligation, ritualistic okay. practices and stuff. Nothing against the churches, but at that time, I felt like it, I had to. You had to be good all the time if you're around any type. Like, what type of church was it, Ryan? At that time, it was before I became, let's see, I just became Catholic. I was in fourth grade. I just turned 10. So, yeah. 
And your parents were Catholic before, and they asked you to no, take it was in. Yeah, before that, it was Protestant, uh, Methodist, stuff like that, yeah. Uh-huh, yeah, that's very similar to mine. Were you practicing throughout that time, or...? I, I went to I went to a Sunday uh, church, like a, it was called a First Assembly of God type Methodist church. I went, to, um, and I went there for a while, and then that's when I when that was from age five all the way up until I was in ten years old, so about five years, five years. Old. It was so, that, and then I switched to Catholic Catholicism. Okay, so throughout this process of you becoming familiar with the belief system of these churches, were you feeling any kind of, were you repelled? Did you want to reject it? Did you just take it for what it was? Were you I able to gracefully move through it with your own belief system? At this time, between the ages of 6 and 10, I started questioning a lot of things that just didn't make sense. That my grandparents, when I, just to back up a little, when I was six years old, my grandparents gave me a Bible. And in the Bible is the children's Bible. And it, so it had the pictures and everything. And it talked about the Old Testament and the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, they showed um, a man in the fiery furnace. They show the picture of Jesus, but he was from the New Testament before he was born, showed him in the fiery furnace. So I, I, my mind was trying to wrap around this. How was he in the fiery furnace in the Old Testament, in, the story, in one of the biblical stories of uh, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego? How was he in the fiery furnace at that time, but yet in the New Testament, right when it hits A.D., he's born, Jesus of Nazareth, and then, you know, how can he be there before he's even born? So mm -hmm. it's about that reincarnational thing. I, uh -huh. It just... That's confusing as a kid. You're, you're looking back and it's like, wait a minute, he's not born yet, but yet he's back in the past. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so my mind questioned it at about age six to seven. And that's where it got me on the journey because I took my little uh, picture Bible to pa public school and I read cool. it. That's how I learned to read. And children, the children are the best with contradictions because they get them from their parents every single day. So yes. they're the best at working out contradictions because they know how to read. They've been used to it um, yes. so much that when you show them something like that, they're so smart. Yes. And yeah, I I looked at it and I said to myself, "How can this be?" And I questioned it. And then that's when I was in Boy Scouts, about ten years of age, ten and a half. I had to be about ten and a half. And the 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 leader. Of, uh, of Boy Scouts, he went to the same church right before I became Catholic at another church, uh, what you call the Methodist Church, and he's and he was the the one of the leaders, and I went over to his house and he was talking to um, about the Bible and stuff, and because it's connected, the Boy Scouts was connected through the church. Correct. The, yeah. yeah. And so we were, you know, I had no problem at the time. I didn't question too much, but the one thing that always stuck in my mind was because in school. We learned about dinosaurs. Mm. So I started questioning. I looked through my picture Bible. I didn't see any dinosaurs. Mm. <laughs> I didn't see anything about these other creatures. I started questioning it. I was like, "What? You know, what's going on here?" So I asked him. I sat down and I remember he goes, "Brian, he goes, you can ask me anything you want about the Bible. Don't be afraid to ask. Go ahead and ask me." And I said, "Okay." I said, this might be a, I, and I said, I said, oh, I got a question for him now. <laughs> I said, all right, where in the Bible does it say, and he had the Bible right in front of me. He says, if you want to look something up, you have a question about anything, you can question me. We'll question it. I said, all right. I said, where in the Bible does it talk about dinosaurs? <laughs> and he looked at me. He had a grin on his face. He's now he's like, he goes, do you have another question? <laughs> he says, I don't know about that one, but do you have another question? He, he didn't. Well, he was at least humble. he was honest. <laughs> yeah. So he was honest, but it's like at the time you're 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 searching for you have so much inside of you in. I was so I was wanting to absorb everything, and I questioned mm -hmm. everything. I never stopped questioning. And 
when I get a little bit older, moving on. Um, yeah, so he he he. I ever since then, I I said, okay, I'm on to something. Mm. And, I, and I dropped it. I never asked anybody else about it. But I knew that something was different. Something didn't make sense. Too yeah, many contradictions. Did that questioning get you into trouble later on in school? Yeah, it did. A little bit. Mo mostly with mom a little bit, you know, following rules, following. It's kind of that. Uh, I wasn't really a big, big rebellious child at the time. I wasn't. I, I snuck out of the house a couple times to a girlfriend's house, but I never, I never, I never really rebelled too much. I was very content. I was very calm. I didn't feel like I had to do, you know, even peer pressure in school. I never mm -hmm. felt like I had to um, do something to get someone's uh, attention or to join a crowd. I didn't feel like I was never under peer pressure. It like bounced off of me or I let it go over my head. I never felt like I, because I always felt like I was in command. I yeah. felt like I was in control of who I was. I didn't need that um, attention as much. You know, I, I didn't feel like I had to go out and do drugs or drink a lot or just anything, you know, that, that, that the body craves for uh, for that emptiness within us or the space to cover things up sometimes or, you know, some things I just I didn't feel like I needed it. It wasn't a, a need. Did you have a lot of friends at school? Uh, no, I didn't. I had, uh, in junior high, I had a lot, but when I got to high school, that all changed. Um, I, I, I felt like Fitting in was harder. I went to a Catholic school from ninth grade through twelfth. So for the how, four how years. How old were you at that time? Just for our international. Um, uh, fifteen, fifteen. I started so, my freshman year. I started in high school. I was fifteen years old. And the high school was a Catholic high school. Catholic. Right? Mm -hmm. was Catholic. It was a junior high and Catholic, uh, junior and senior high. Yeah. So it was for yeah from seventh eighth grade for the junior high part. But I didn't go there until I started my freshman year. Mm hmm. It was a Catholic school. Yep. Um, so you, you were know. old enough then to start considering, you know, what your future holds. Oh, this is the funny thing. Before that, yes, going into that, when I was in high school, I was very connected to prophecy. Mm. Um, I was really drawn to the Book of Revelations, big time. Mm. I, I I was like I. It talked about the three day something about um, not three days of darkness the Bible, but it was like um, I, I got wrapped up into it. I got wrapped up into the belief the system. Wrapped up in the rapture. Yeah, the rapture, the pre-rapture, and like the good people go to heaven, and then if you're bad, you go to hell, and there's like a purgatory, a holding place, mm -hmm. and it just drove my mind crazy. And I and I started to talk with people about it. I started questioning even about that, like yeah. How you know and why and why would God be so judgmental and condemning people? That is, that's just not what I was raised to believe. You yeah. know, I, I was well, raised that God's yeah, yeah, that yeah. God's good, holy. Um, it's mankind or humans who, and I realized that as I got older, that we're the ones that are doing the judging. <laughs> God doesn't have to judge anyone. We're the ones that do it. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So. Self-imposed. So, did you have um, what, what, at that age, what what did you want to do for a job? Did you have any like ideas, like big dreams of what you wanted to do? Was there? At the time when I got out of high school in the nineties, I didn't, I didn't, you know, the technology wasn't like we have today. Um, I thought about. Uh, computer programming or, or computers, just computers in general. Um, sitting at an office job, like I, because I, I really thought about in high school, I didn't have a real strong desire of one way or the other. I was still up in the air at the time on job wise, um, but my mother kept persisting that I just find something, you know, just mm. find something, Brian. Did you have uh, a dream? Anything, you know, when you were a kid of dream job? Anything that was like. For you know, without any conditioning, without any influence of parents or whatever, yeah. was there anything there? No, and this is the funny thing. I I I, I was lost. Ah, I, I, okay. No. Um, for example, I for me, yeah. it was being a national, 
that was my dream to go into space. So, yeah. but then I realized what I had, to, you know, the how rare it is to be an astronaut. And then by the time you get to a certain age, I, I mean, did I still, think that did cross my mind. An astronaut, you, okay, yeah, I wanted, because it seems to be yeah. a very key thing with a lot of people who are within our circles that they they have this just fascination with space and traveling space, going and visiting and stuff. And I just wanted to see if that, especially the males. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did. And that was a little bit earlier than high school, but I do remember thought about that um, that 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 going like traveling to different planets. I have thought about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My only yeah. thing was how was I going to have the money to build a ship and <laughs> go there? I always thought about a rocket ship. This is even even in junior high school and high school, I didn't even know about the crap, the circular, um, the UFOs. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we call your modern day, you know, the, sh the sphere. Basic. Yeah. I, I wasn't even thinking about that. It was only the religion. I was into the prophecy. I was into the biblical stuff. But And yeah. the other uh, book that really got to me was uh, Ezekiel, A Wheel Within a Wheel. And those mm -hmm. little, you know, stories, I've always been fascinated how it, and to this day I realize now it was talking about a spaceship yep. and yep. this movement. So I just, it occurred to me, you know, after I got out of high school, wow, you know. These are like interactions with extraterrestrial, so it's really cool. So, in in this time, did you have any more interaction, contact interaction that you mm, remember? Or? Not in high school. Moving a little bit forward, it was after I got out of high school. About five years after I got out of high school, I felt this urge to try to find something. It was getting close. Let's see here. It was the mid 90s going into the late 90s I felt like I need to find something I need to find me I started questioning like what kind of job where would I work um, you know what would be something so I can start supporting myself and I got into taking care of people in around 1999 2000 I found that well I'm good with people maybe I'll just work with people for a while um, yeah. And I was going to school part time, off and on, um, just taking a course here or there. So it wasn't consistency; it was just off and on. Yeah. Um, and it it led me, at least going that direction. Um, I started questioning stuff, but it gave me so much time. I was working third shift in around 1999 to 2000. I started working mm -hmm. third shift, the first time I ever had a third shift job what you call it, the graveyard shift or the night shift. Yeah. And I, it gave me so much free time. I was taking care of a couple, a couple of uh, elderly women, and it gave me so much of free time at night because I didn't have really anything else to do. Mm. And so I started to um, look up stuff around extraterrestrials. Around, I, so I got hooked on coast to coast radio with George Norton, uh, well, Art yeah. Bell, Art Bell at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So it was right before George Norrie took over in 2001, 2002, 2003, somewhere around there, yeah. George Norrie took over. And I remember Art would come in every once in a while on the weekends or something, do some shows. But I heard coast to coast, and that right there opened up a floodgate of, mm -hmm. of knowledge, like remembrance. And about then those visions came back of when I was six years old, being on yeah. the ship or something. I remember. Yeah. I started questioning. I was like, oh, my gosh. You know, the deja vu, the remembrance, all started flooding in. And so from and 2000, about 2004, 2004 onward is when I really got involved with spiritual growth. Yeah. So that's, that's about the time of the advent of the Internet and people having personal computers at home. Yes. So yes. I imagine that was, uh, you know, you would have spent a lot of time searching on there, see what you could find. Did you find yes. much then? It was kind of new. Uh, about 2000, 2001, it was fairly new in late the late 90s until about 2000s. It started, the speed started sp picking up a little bit, you know what I mean? Because I remember times when it took just a JPEG file, it took forever to load. You know, it took minutes just to load one image. But now, with the speeds through the years, um, I started really digging into research about angels, 
about extraterrestrials, about the devil and you know demons. I wanted to understand why did the church fear this so much? Mm -hmm. I wanted to know why it was such a fear for them. Why mm -hmm. not even question these things? Why why is it we always talk about it in the Bible but yet no one digs deeper. We don't bring we don't dialogue deeper on these meanings. We don't it's just very limited. You know, in a, in a, a ritualistic of some of the churches, that I would I was hoping that more of the churches would be at least the ones I was attending. I was wanting the Catholic Church to be more interactive. Mm. You know what I mean? I wanted to be a little bit more interactive. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, I, I, but it was like I felt like they just you know they weren't they weren't questioning much, and it was kind of sad. It was kind of disappointing. So I started to branch away from the church um, around 16 years of age, 16, 17 years of age. So when I was about sophomore, junior in high school, I kind of gave up on it for a while. Yeah. Brian, can I ask you, um, what what's your date of birth? Uh, don't give us the year if you don't want to. It's just out uh, of interest because a lot of people follow astrology and things like that. April 10th. I'm an Aries. Harry Sunshine. Okay. All right. Thanks for that. <laughs> okay. So you found the internet. Yes. And then there was the invention of Windows. I remember when that all came about, and and you know that was just a huge change, and I was so excited that the internet was around and people across the world could connect to each other. That was just amazing to me. So I imagine for you, did you move and levitate towards groups that were starting to form? You know, I remember the the Yahoo rooms, chat rooms and those kinds of things. So did you find yourself moving towards groups like that or were you more exploring what your own perception was, was looking for answers for your particular questions? Yes, I didn't really join the groups in the beginning. I was more, and I really didn't, I think it was only one or two groups, but I really focused on self-exploration i really yeah. I, I thank god for the internet i mean it's it's a doorway to so much information so much yeah. knowledge but it's um you find so much but i learned to appreciate it because it was it was like something you don't find in the classrooms or mm -hmm. in our school books you know it's so much more and because it was so much more it, it gave me such a grand opportunity to explore different concepts and how from all over the world of like other people in other countries and their cultures and how they view the US and how we view them and, yeah. and I thought to myself what a great idea if we could bring more people together and find out you know what we have in common not yes. so much our differences it was what we have in common and so it really drove me to to be more of a type of the humanitarian type uh, working with different groups and just um, so whoever I came in contact with, just to show them so much love and compassion that it, they would just melt in a way where they felt more comfortable with who they are. Yes. Picking up on love and compassion, Brian. Yeah. Um, you, you're one of those members that seems to uh, just, I don't know what the word is, but you just exude it. Is that the word? You just mm -hmm. emanate exactly. this compassion and, and, and love. Where 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 did you where does that come from? Was it something you you learned from your family or friends, or was that just an innate knowledge to you through your life? It's always been there, but I went through a lot of um, I guess you call the pain, the turmoil behind the scenes. Yeah. My parents got a divorce when I was about seventeen years of age, right before I turned seventeen. So I was just a sophomore in high school, and it affected me. I was kind of actually happy about it, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Saddened, but I was more happy because when I was in junior high school, I started to see mom and dad drift apart a little bit more, more and more and more. And I told myself, they're just, they're not, you know, the way that they, their interaction, they're not really meant to be with each other at that time. You know, it's time for them to move on. My younger brother's were more affected by it and my sister was a house I have a younger sister and yeah. that affected them big time but I was you know around 16 17 years of age 
I was okay with it. My dad came downstairs and said, Brian, I have something to tell you. I remember it <laughs> as clear as day. Mm. Your mother and I are getting a divorce. And I stopped. I looked at him. I smiled. I put my hand on his shoulder. I said, Dad, I said, I understand. I said, I love you no matter what. But wherever you go, I always love you. And I told him, and I gave him a big hug. And he kind of shed some tears, and I kind of did too. But yeah. I, I was very content. I didn't react, like overreact at that time, that moment. I felt yeah. like I understood it. I, mm. I felt like it was okay to let go of Dad, you know? Is that fair? Yeah. yeah. And, but the only fear that was coming behind me was, now Brian's got to step up. Brian's got to be the man yeah. of the house. Yeah. I was like, I'm only six, 17. I don't want all that responsibility. <laughs> Not yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so... <clears throat> there was there was this the fear that okay now I have to take on father role or dad role you know what I mean for my younger brothers and my sister yeah and I wasn't ready for that and I had an opportunity to move in with my grandmother that following summer after my parents got a divorce ah. and I took it I I had to get away from the house I told mom I love you mom but I need my space wow I, I don't want to be the father figure. I'm not ready for that. Yeah. So my grandmother, graciously enough, she allowed me to stay with her and live with her for many more years, for another, until I was in my late 20s, believe it or not. Wow. About 28, about 27, 28, I stay, I live with my grandmother. And so you're, not, yes. Sorry, go on. Yeah, she was, she was, she took me in. She made stuff for me, and we traded off. Like, I would do chores for her, mowing the grass, and she would let me stay at her house. And it was like a win-win for both of us. And she had company because she was just living alone at the time, my grandmother. So it was really nice to be there for her. Yeah, right. Roxy, did you want to add something? I saw your mic was off. Yeah, I just wanted to say, Brian, that that is just... I'm 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 mesmerized on how beautiful your journey is so far. So I just want to I just want to add that in there. That is absolutely an amazing, amazing reality you set up. So continue. I'm just I'm hooked, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to skip forward a little bit now, Brian, because we know you're a father. We know yes. that you have children now yourself, and you have taken on that role of being the being the father figure. Has um. Through those years of being a father, did any of your spirituality, any of that interest change? Did you have like a diversion or, you know, were you distracted with, with things while you were bringing up the kids and having a relationship with your wife? Before that, let me go back just a little bit. Sure. Yeah, yeah it, it really did. It was beautiful, Roey. It, it helped me. When I became a father for the first time, I told myself, I don't want to put the kids through at least so much so if I can control it I didn't want them to not have a father you know what I mean I want them to have a father I, I want them I wanted to be there for them um, and what my parents went through I said I don't want to ever go through that <laughs> so I wanted to be the best father I could possibly be mm -hmm. and um, I'm so I'm always there for them and doing that it, it Spiritually, um, having children, it I really it helped grounded me even more. It helped yeah. ground me more. I believe. I think that's what being the father. It I woke up more that I'm not only now responsible for me. I felt more responsible for them, and for you know at the time my wife Sarah. So yes. Yeah. And so in recent years. Okay, the obvious question that everybody will want to know, how did you find Hugo? Yes, leading up to that. Um, oh, yeah, let me go through this. I, right before I met Hukolo, Max, and Jim, I was, um, I was, uh, right after I went through a divorce myself, and I want to explain this a little bit more because I think this is so important. Mm -hmm. um, the divorce was very interesting. It was a divorce that did not have to be. And I, before I even went back to that route, 
or what that way um, and it led to that was I asked the universe I asked the universe yeah. please assist me in a way that I can bring out the best gifts possible of myself and sure enough I got it and I didn't want it but you know at that time that way to happen but um, my wife at the time her name was Sarah and she filed for a divorce and the reasoning before it, behind that, and, I, and I'll be very honest with you guys, <clears throat> I was so much in the spiritual journey, and she wasn't, in a way where she was not asking the big questions, and I was just starting getting into channeling a couple of years back, mm -hmm. and about three years ago. So this was leading up to Hukalo. This was all leading up to Hukalo. And I was questioning, and it scared her because I started to talk about the stuff around her and she wasn't ready for it. Yeah. It scared her so much so that and I told her, I said, Sarah, I would love to be a channeler. I'd love yeah. to do what and I showed her, I gave her some examples. I showed her some Bashar. I showed her some other things. But it was so her fear at the time was, oh my God, Brian's starting to change. What is my mother gonna think of him? What is uh -huh. dad gonna think of him? What's my brothers, my siblings going to think of Brian? He's starting yeah. to go, you know, he's, he's, he's evolving, he's changing, but I'm not sure if I'm ready for to follow down with Brian or follow that path. You know what I mean? It was just something that she thought that it was going to change and affect her too. Yeah. See, isn't that an interesting yeah. parallel? Because yeah. when a lot of the beings say that we are not ready for contact, you know, we're not, even if we change with our partners, you know, even our partners, our human partners, are not even ready for us enlightening, for us raising our vibration. So when we raise our vibration and the partner is not or not aware, yes. the same, the same, well, a very similar parallel of how the aliens would not be able to interact with many humans right now because there is fear, because they're yes. so of high vibration. That is a really interesting parallel you picked up on there. Thank you. Yes, because. Those, when you're becoming that, you're asking the deeper questions of life. You're not afraid of the churches. You, you want to really know what happens is the people around you, it affects your family, your close-knit family, your friends around you. It will affect them in yeah. some way, shape, or form. A lot of friends will move away from you. A lot of, you know, <clears throat> parents sometimes don't want to talk about it. They, they'll push it away. It's a scary subject. It's because yeah. it's unknown to them or it's so foreign to them that yeah. they're not, they, it, it just scares them. But they're also the biggest fear is, is what others think around them. Yeah, That's mm -hmm. what holds them in the state of, I don't want to go down that road because what are others going to think of me if I follow down that path? Right. It's, and, it, and it scared them in that moment, yes. And, and I would add the other one is as well that, once, once people start going down that path, you know, that's when they really do start getting a little bit like, whoa, what's happening to my partner? They're doing yes. this and they're doing that, and that fear starts mm. coming in as well. Yes. Like they're changing, but I'm not. Mm. And it's really the person that's doing the spiritual, that's the thing I had to step back. It was nothing wrong with Sarah. It was mm -hmm. me. I'm the one that had to take the responsibility. I'm the one that realized that it was me that was changing. It yeah. wasn't that I, and I wasn't trying to force it. That was the thing. But I was talking about it. It became more of like Sarah. This is so exciting. It was my excitement in the eyes. When your eyes get big, <laughs> that can scare a lot of people. <laughs> so that's. I realized and I started catching myself that it was too late. Sarah decided, yeah. I can't wow. handle this. Because what if people at work found out that you're into this? I don't want to lose my job over this, Brian. That's what she told me. She was afraid of losing her job. And I said, Sarah, how can you lose your job if someone believes in something different? But because it was too out there, it was yeah. hard for her to accept that. And that's another one of the things as well, is people who have a certain belief structure of their own, and then when this one comes along, it's very challenging. You have, you, like you said, you're asking the big, deep questions here, 
and it can be very challenging to someone else's belief system. And sometimes people will just be like, "What? No way! You know, I'm not going down there because they don't even want to change because they're happy in their little structure." Sure, and it's okay. And that was the thing I had to learn. I had to remember and be respectful of her belief system, and, yeah. and I did. And it was too late. And then when I then when I met Hukalo after the divorce, I met you guys. It was wonderful. I, I found you through like a, a link of, a, of something a channeling, and I was I was always into channeling. That's another thing I just want to share real quick. The things the the channelers that inspired me were people like Sophia, uh, what they call the goddess of wisdom. There was you know she doesn't channel anymore, but uh, Christina Keene that brings through Sophia, but. There was the wonders. The wonders are another great source of information. They're they're up there like with Cryon, and we everyone a lot of people know who Cryon and Bashar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the wonders, Sophia, oh, a Crimson Circle, with a, oh, yeah. Adamus, yeah. Saint Germain, Adamus. Um, these are the the ones that the core group of channelers that inspired me to take this message and expand upon it. And so I get a lot of their information, and I try to make it my own. I re like use it in a way that I can share with others in my own words. But it's so brilliant that there's such an inspiration. You know, one of the core groups on the planet that really started to they're 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 big. And another, be honest with you, another inspiration just most recently in this past year that I've really grown to love and respect. Is Roxy? Yeah, I love Roxy's energy. I love how she can take the masculine and the divine feminine and the divine masculine and combine it and make it her own. This is what inspires me. When people can do that and balance themselves, it's yeah. so. It's like wow. It's a reflection. I can be true to myself. And so, yes, I Roxy has inspired me this past year, and I and I love her for that. Thank you, Roxy. You're welcome, and you're making me blush. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I can see you blushing even though you weren't on camera. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> but it's, it's so it's a it's a wonderful feeling, and and I see that just like that ripple effect. It is really shaping our realities, our perceptions in the moment, and and whatever we look at, because all that I see, I command. Mm -hmm. It's really perception. All I see, all that I see, I command. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. It's powerful. It's a powerful statement. It's the existence. I am who I am, and so these are the things that I really love. Very nice, Brian. So, what do you see in your future? Do you have goals, or are you living in the now? More in the now, in the moment. Um, I do have like um, things that I project into the future. Um, you know. Me working on school right now. I'm in school. I'm a junior in college. I'm going toward my uh, um, psychology degree, and really? my so projecting into uh, becoming the teacher that I am, but having a license so I can really share this with more of the mainstream, mm -hmm. more of mainstream. I want to bridge more of the spirituality with mainstream. You know what I mean? Um, kind of bridge the uh, the gap. Yep. I want to bring it where where spirituality is universal, but bring it where it's more appreciated. Bring it down to a level where it can be the person on the street can just get it. You know, help and explain it in a way that touches the heart and moves people from the heart, not much, no much, not so much from the mind. You know. Yes. Well, with the changes coming up, I think you're going to be in big demand, my friend. Yes. 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 <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. So Hukalo, going back to that, how I met Max and Jim, mm -hmm. um, I found them through, uh, I think, from a link through Bashar or something. And on the side, I saw uh, Max doing Reiki oh. on Jim. And I was almost two years ago. Yeah, it's almost two years ago. Yeah. And I was hooked. I'm like, wow, this guy Max is amazing. And, and, and how Jim was starting to bring these other entities through. And I was like, this is really inspirational. Yeah. And I said, I would like to join their group or try to connect with them somehow. And then when one day, Max opened it up and had this hangout. And I was like, you know, over two years, I was like, I got to get on that. 
I want to I want to jump on there and talk to these people because I resonated with the Who Club yeah. members. I resonated so deeply with it's a it's a sacred space. It's a I felt like it's a place where I can be me. I didn't feel like yeah. I have to be this person over here or over there. I could just let go down my guard. I could be vulnerable. That mm -hmm. was the thing. I wanted to be able to be vulnerable because I felt like that was a place of power, your vulnerability. Yeah. And and if I just, just spoke who I am and not trying to change, change myself and just I could I could fit in. I felt like I, it was a, a calling, a belonging. And yeah. I'm sure happy that I took that opportunity to connect with you guys. So, yeah, yeah, I met some wonderful people on here. And I continue. It's just growing so much, Hukalo. And I'm so mm. happy for that. So my passions now are doing interviews with up-and-coming channelers, um, some of the languages, the galactic languages that we practice and play around with. These things inspire me because I know it's like triggers. It, 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 mm. it helps unlock people's potential, uh, inspirational. So things that are inspirational, uh, uplifting, um, I'm all for that. I'm definitely, it, no matter how or how it's perceived or how it's done, it still it comes from the heart. You know, that's the beauty of it. It's coming yeah. from the heart. It's it's moving. It's movement of energy. It's a movement yeah. of energy. So that, that's cool. That's a lovely perception. Well, thank you, Brian. Is there anything else that you would like to share before we wind this up? Um, yeah, I, I, I just want to say thank you to all of you out there. Um, and those who would like to get in touch with me, um, just go through Hukalo. Um, my, I want to say my email address, but I'll go ahead and state it. I don't have it up here right here, but it's uh, BTS area 888 at hotmail.com. Okay. And that's my my email address for those who would like to get in touch with me or through Hukalo here. Um, yeah. You want to just say that again, Brian, just for people who might have had to rush to get a pen. Yes. Uh, my email, one of my personal emails is B T S area E, I mean A R E A eight 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 the number, and then at hotmail dot com. Okay, great. Okay, and if uh, they want to add you on Google Plus, is it Brian with a hat? I think is yes, that that. Yes, find the hat. Just look for the signature hat. Yeah, yeah. So just type in Brian with a hat on G Plus, um, and also Brian's got um, a, a YouTube account associated with his um, mm -hmm. with his G Plus, and he's been doing lots of really interesting interviews with new people who have been joining the group and. Um, I'm sure in the future we're going to see interviews with some of the older members of other groups yes. coming to Brian because he does a really good job. So mm -hmm. we're letting carry on with that, I think. <laughs> but I'm um, I'm in the process of um, uh, actually becoming a, a deep trance channeler, so I, yeah. I'm real happy Ooh. about that. Well, I've I've actually had the pleasure of seeing your channel before, and it's wonderful. I've seen you work with people within the group, one on one or in very small groups, and the stuff you've been doing with people. I mean, you've got to be commended. I mean, a lot of people might not see this because a lot, not always, what's happening in Hukalo goes on in a webinar or in a hangout. Mm -hmm. People who vibrate with similar resonations get together. They help each other channel, and I know for sure. I, I, do, I do know because I've been there, and that Brian is one of those people that I don't. Know, if you if you if he feels like you have a resonation with him, he'll pick you up and, and start working with you. So I want to congratulate uh, Brian on on doing that. Um, I was going to ask Roxy if uh, Roxy had any questions. Um, she wanted to ask Brian as well. Um. You know, Brian, it's it's not more, much of a question as, as a statement, just to see, you know, the parallels between, I think it's a lot of parallels between a lot of the awake people on that inter-knowing at such a young age that mm -hmm. something is just off, and I love how you expressed it. 
maybe you went to the church because that was the right thing to do. Maybe you did that, but and 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 went to Boy Scouts and tried the different ideas for because that's what looked like the status quo. But there was always that innate idea of Brian inside going, "No, I got to question this." <laughs> that right there, I just see that throughout a lot of the awakened idea yes. that we're just not fitting in. It's not that everyone is wrong. We just don't agree, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, it, it, I, I love that the, I guess it's power, the power of that calling that just, you just sit in your knowing, your true knowing that, okay, no, it's something different. And then that leads to questioning, and then that you will start expanding. And it's beautiful. I just freaking love it. <laughs> Thank you, Roxy. Much love to you. Thank you. So, Brian, and then if you have any, um, you have any pinnacle moments you want to share with your experiences with Hugh Clare? Anything that you feel um, would yes. be beneficial for people to hear? The pinnacle moment for me was also the languages, the galactic languages, is what we call them, the light languages. Um, I wanted to thank Sabrina out there. Everyone knows who I th believe at this time knows who Sabrina is. Uh, she helped me with the languages at the beginning. To break through and with G Gabriel those two really helped me and I wanted to say thank you for, to both of them um, the pinnacle thing that really shifted this for me was all of you because every member that I come in contact with or just meet on a hangout I love interacting one-on-one -on -one with you and as a group both because I get to know more of who you are and your vulnerability comes out. And when we can share these intimate moments, whether it's five minutes or an hour or two hours, I love every moment of it. Mm. This is why I'm here. Because I want to bring out the best in you, all of you. And I love you. Yes. That's beautiful. Thank you, Brian. It's a beautiful yeah. message. I think a lot of us feel the same way. And that's why we're all so amazing. So thank you for being a leader. Thank, Thank you, you for being a listener. Thank you for being a teacher. And, um, yep, anybody who needs to contact you, just rewind the video a little bit. Brian's email address is there. Um, and join me in the Hangouts. Please don't be afraid. Just private message me. Jump in sometimes when I'm free, uh, usually during the day. In the evenings, it can be a little hectic. So, you know, I want to spend time with my children and on the weekends but usually through the day you guys can just reach me just send me shoot me a text or something and in the chats and I love to hang out with you guys I really I really love and honor and respect all of you thank you nice thank you Brian thank you Brian thank you Brian thank you um so Absolutely. I think on that note we might wrap this up unless anybody has anything else to say no well let people have I'm beautiful <laughs> Don't you have to want to add, Brian? Anything else you want to say? Um, just, just being here as the, as a, a co-creator with all of you. I think it's just beautiful. Um, we're gonna create some amazing stuff, and we're so these groups that we can inspire and others to form stuff. You know, like these kind of groups. That is, that's mm -hmm. what it's, it's gonna take to really expand consciousness, and I, and I love it. So if you're an up-and-coming channeler, you're part of Huclo or any other groups, and you want to schedule or organize an interview, Brian surely would like to hear from you. Um, I know he's really, really keen and interested on um, talking to these people and, and, and ex giving you exposure as well and watching you grow because mm -hmm. as a group, we know we see ourselves grow by watching others grow. So we recognize that reflection and we welcome that. And Brian's just taken that up on himself. And like many of us within the group, we're, we're, we're branching out, but we're still part of the group, but we're branching out in all our different directions, covering a lot of bases and, and spreading the love. And, and I find that just absolutely such a beautiful concept and, and visualization. And it makes the world so enjoyable. It really does. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Brian. You, Brian. All right. Can I wind and, and one last thing, Brian. Real quick, no. Brian. Hey, Brian. Yeah. yeah. Real quick. Thanks for showing up. Yes. Really. 
<laughs> Thank you, Roxy. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, this was a, a human colony. Uh, .org production. It, it's um, Hugh Colo, as we call ourselves. We've got a little tag there. Um, if you ever want to find us online, if you hashtag Hugh Colo, H U C O L O. I always have to think about that a little bit. <laughs> and um, you, can, you can find our website if you're interested in what we do. You can you can sign up there and, and get stuck in. If you've got any qualities you want to bring. You know, we are more than open to all sorts of artistic qualities from music to design to, to all sorts of things. And obviously we're a channeling community as well. So we encourage the um, the looking to you get your inner voice, you know, that, that special part of yourself that you want to be the best. Um, so we encourage people to be more of that and we welcome that so much. So if you're interested in that, check out www.humancolony.org. Come and sign up. Speak to Brian. Roxy's there too. Speak to Roxy. Me and Kim. Um, there's loads of people there willing to interact. Such friendly faces. So I want to send my love for myself. Yes, and most definitely from me. Kim, Kim, from love to all from Roxy. Roxy, and from also from Brian. <laughs> okay, guys. Thank you very much, and um, we will see you in another now. Ciao.